So um, thank you very much for coming. I know it's Friday morning. Um, we're glad that even though the class is listed differently this year, it's a little harder for you guys to access. We're glad you found your way to come and, and spend time with us. Um, Professor Eager and I really just really want to teach you guys a few things. And from past experience, we know that you like the examples and because it's learned from them, that's one thing that you remember and it's not something that you get out of everyone's class. Um, so there's, you know, essentially the theme of the class is not changing a whole lot, but I do have to say that uh, this essentially, yep, it does say low battery, but. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about me. I'll talk about the requirements for the class. A few words about engineering. Somebody mentioned what is PE. So it's, you guys are senior year. We're, we're just going to try to make sure we get a good start. And I want to engage with you. If you want to interrupt me, that's great. I will try to repeat it for the people remotely if I try to. But at the same time, I really appreciate you guys coming because we get to interact a lot more. So the, the sign-up sheet, uh, for those who came just a little later, if, if, you haven't, if you think you haven't put your name yesterday or, or Wednesday on it, uh, just raise your hand and I will, will pass it on to you or we'll just leave it there for you exit the class. It's just a second way that we do use to communicate, but uh, the Stellar, I think, is the, uh, the preferred way. If you haven't registered what we want to be added, you can send me an email or send any of the contact information and email, and we can add you as a listener or whatever uh, it is that's needed. Um, so I started um, my career, I guess, after my PhD here in course three in 2006. Um, I'm originally from Quebec, Canada. Uh, so I came here for my PhD and I just stayed. And uh, I worked for a big consulting company for five years. And then I started my own consulting company um, at the same time, I started lecturing here. So I've been doing this class for five years now. And uh, for the past 18 months, I'm also growing a startup. <laughs> and I have one-year-old twins. So <laughs> that's, that's about it, though. I don't have anything else going on, really, of significance. Uh, so uh, the way I want to do this this semester is still focus on the, the core curriculum that I've been developing over the past two years or so. Uh, but I will... Um, try to get any input from you guys to steer it some, in some directions. Um, so about the class, um, it's met as a learning process. We give you guys more autonomy than what you get in a lot of classes. So you have to complete three modules that are 12 hours each. We are providing two live modules right now. I'm doing one, Professor Eager is doing one. We don't really, we have to work the schedule and we're gonna post it online for the month of September because we, we know it by now. Um, there may be sometimes some changes. Um, you know, if you like the class and you can make the schedule, what's great is uh, Professor Eager and I work by complementarity. We've also been uh, consulting associates for, for five years. so. Uh, I know what he's teaching in the class, and I'm doing a little bit the, the, the other side of it. So Professor Eager started, I know very general yesterday, about how we go about selecting material. And um, the main topic I'll cover is how we make them uh, from the beginning, uh, from when you have a liquid metal. We're not going to go into refining and stuff. And we're going to go quickly, and I'll show you some example of where it matters, where it's useful for any engineer. I know there's some chemical engineers here, mechanical, there probably is one or two nuclear, you know, it's, it's all over the place. So this is meant to be general and, and be helpful to everybody. But again, if you feel like there's something I'm going over that's too complicated and you, and you have a question, just go ahead, raise your hand and we'll, we'll, we'll address it right off the bat. Um, requirements. So we talked about you have 36 hours of listening to us live or online. For each of these modules, you have to prepare a one-page summary. And I don't know that we've uh, established a schedule yet, but last year was a little difficult. We gave a, a late deadline and everybody put in <laughs> that date. So the, you know, providing feedback was a little tough. 
So I think what I'll suggest this year, but that's not confirmed, is you know, when you're done with one, you can provide it. We're not going to give you the extra month, and then you rush in the end to do it. So it's a very accelerated course. So uh, because we lecture almost every day, Professor Yeager mentioned yesterday, by mid-August, mid uh, October, we'll be done, or roughly, or sometime in October. So it's an advantage as opposed to your other courses, and I think that um, there's nothing like uh, taking a few notes or writing a few things down on your computer when you get home to think about, okay, so what did I learn today? What did I learn after the first four hours? And then you just use that as a, a way to self-learn. I mean, I go to meetings and I go to conferences and I take notes because otherwise a year later I have no idea <laughs> what I did. So I think it's the same process for you guys. Are you going to be you know, professors, you're going to be engineers, you may be business people, who knows exactly what you're going to go and do. Maybe some of you become, you know, patent attorneys, all that stuff. Uh, it's, it's a good practice to keep notes for yourself of what you've learned. And that's the only thing we want to see in there. There's no point in you trying to tell us what we want to hear. We just want to hear that you've learned something and that you're going to keep it. That's, that's the purpose. It is the same for the, the, uh, the student presentation. You have to give a 10, 15 minute presentation and we want to feel like you went through the process of learning something and, and trying to think about how you're gonna present it to the class. And most of you do very well on those, uh, on those presentations. There will be a few people that decide to take something they've done for you know, the thesis proposal or something like that. And, it's okay, but personally, I do like to see that you've gone through some process of thinking, you know, associated with this class, what do I would want to learn? Anything. I mean, it's not about trying to do an experiment or build something. There are few people that to do that. But it really is, you know, taking something you've already done, but putting it in perspective of the class or doing a little research on something and presenting. Let's say, I would like to know uh, how BMW decided to spend money on batteries. You know, that's just a very typical example. And if you're interested with that, that's great. There is literature, <laughs> you know, that it's, it's been documented and you don't have to go through a huge process. So you learn and then you try to verbalize it to the class. And a lot of time the students, uh, you know, we, we, we're not, we don't uh, feel bad about it, but they're as interested to hear each other than hearing us. It's just, it's just my experience for the past couple of semesters. So it's a great thing. So it's, it's, it's a learning experiment. Um, and um, I think it's a relatively unique in the Institute, but we, we have to put these requirements. So you do have to turn in these three uh, doc, one page document for the summary. So we have a way to say that we evaluated you. Any questions on the class? Yes? Are there examples of student presentations we can watch? So yes, we do have uh, examples of student presentation. We'll try to see how exactly it can be available. This is something that happened in the past. Um, so I'll put a note on that and see how we, we can follow up. We have time. So let's say within a week or so, I'll try to get back to you on that. Um, anything else? Yes? Can you share which modules you'll be covering in class so we can decide? Yep. Uh, that's in the, the slide. So we'll, we'll, I think we'll start there. Well, engine. So before, so the, the, the before we start into the presentation. So engineering, uh, which is really the essence of what that Professor Eager has been promoting into this class. You know, he'll talk about how you you end up selecting materials. Um, I'll talk today a little bit about safety. Um, the professional engineering status, to be a professional engineer is something that you wouldn't want to start planning before you graduate because you can take the fundamental of engineering, FE, test um, ahead and it's the best time because you have all that knowledge of the classwork in your head. You know, I had to do it after and it, it's more painful. It's been two, three years, you've done statistics and now you have to spend two months preparing for that test. So, to become a professional engineer, you have to first do a fundamental of engineering uh, written test. It's half a day. Uh, it's done locally once a year. So you can't just do it exactly when you'd like. 
And um, the second step is um, get actual experience. So for, I believe it's three years, um, it depends on how many degrees you've got. Um, you have to be practicing in engineering and be supervised by engineers. And then you're eligible to do the, the, the final exam uh, to become a professional engineer. And that's, it's the status that's just absolutely required in anything that is uh, mandated in construction. If, if I put together even a, a house, there's going to be a structural engineer that says this, this house meets the code, meets the building code. Um, cars and airplanes, it's a little different because it's, there's a lot more of uh, responsibility of the automakers to make the car good. So the, the official license is not applicable. You don't have to submit your plans to somebody for building a car. You do have to make it right. Uh, so there's, it's, it's just a very, very different industry. So the people that know most about the professional engineering license are the civil engineers, some mechanical engineers, uh, nuclear engineers, petroleum engineers. It's, it's pretty big to have that. And it doesn't really matter which specialty you take because once you are becoming professional, you over time define what's your area of expertise. Like I didn't mine in metallurgy, but most of my work is in mechanical systems. But it, by experience and training, I'm qualified to do the mechanical engineering side of things. I think it's a very good exercise. I think at least it's something for you guys to be aware of because there was a question um, at the very beginning. So what we do in engineering is we try to help society in different ways. Uh, it could be to improve the impact on the environment of our lives. It could be by just simply making fun stuff that uh, is, 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 is interesting to use, uh, making transportation safer, making uh, water safer, uh, dams, you know, preventing flooding. It's, it's all engineering. So it's taking knowledge that exists out of science. Like science tells you if you put a, a, an impermeable barrier that's not falling, then you'll stop the flooding. You know? so, in, so it is, it is a lot, and, and it, that's been my belief ever since I was a um, graduate student, I think, that there's a lot of knowledge that we have out there, and then it's a matter of putting it together in the right order. So it actually is very useful. So um, there are 20 definitions of engineering. Probably if you ask Professor Eager, he'll go on with it for, for a while. And it, it, he has a very nice perception on it. I think he's got 10 definitions of engineering. So, I'm mentioning it mostly because we of the, the P status I have. So I'm licensed in eight different states. But in the end, uh, my practice covers, um, it's, it's kind of um, through the US. And there's a point where I think people have to accept that you qualify. You know, if, and if you, if you paid the fee for this specific state or not, that's, at some point, I just can't do it. I can't just fill out that paperwork and keep track of it and have a, you know, a new form each, each week to uh, to sign and return. Uh, okay, so we're moving on to talk a little bit about what the class is about practically. It's about using structural materials. So uh, we're not gonna talk about, you know, microchips uh, and how you can make them smaller for functionality reasons and all that. We're not really into optical properties. Um, there's, there's a number of things we don't touch with respect to materials that are very useful. But in the grand scheme of things, you will you know, see us talk about how the materials are made. That's, that's going to be a topic for me. Uh, how they process, how they perform, how exactly we figure out their properties. And I'm not going to make big assumptions that you already are an expert. Uh, but sometime I may take a jump and you, you just step in and say, hey, well, what is this? You know, you just mentioned the grains and I don't know what grain are. That's perfectly fine. Uh, we can go over that. But I put it a little bit in line here in the order of things that I think is, it matters is you have to make the materials and go through a series of, of decision process, material selection, which Professor Eager is going to curve, is, is going through the end of it. Uh, before it actually gets into service. And um, it's, it's a very long process, and it's, I think it's a good recognition. It's something that I'll try to do uh, this fall to make sure that you understand 
that you just don't pick a material and call it a day. That there's, a, there's a lot of implication, especially if you're making a change. Because in engineering, when things have been done in a certain way for 30 years and nothing bad happened, that is pretty good data. It's, it's much better than me thinking that I'm a smart, you know, MIT graduate and I'm going to make this a lot better just by changing this. You know, there's a, there's a lot of implication to any decision we make about structural material, whether the, the like you could think for, I'll just take an example. So you can use um, galvanized steel in an environment where you can have a fire. And if the fire uh, causes the zinc to melt, it can just make the steel break. It's, it's, un, it's unacceptable if this is a critical structure that, you know, you have a fire and everything falls all of a sudden. You know, it's, it's still done a lot, but it's essentially is done in conditions where you just really don't expect a fire. There's a risk associated with it, but it's, it's just an example of, you know, safety getting into the way of everything else, the cost, the performance, um, the, the, the aesthetic aspect, it's, it just overrides everything all of a sudden. You say, I just don't want to do this because the risk of a fire is this much. If it happens, then there's a problem. It's the same way that you could say, I'm going to make um, the bridge all out of concrete and everything's going to be fine except if I have an earthquake. You know, it, it, we can't do that. <laughs> so. Um, it, 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 there's a lot of decision process that goes all along the way from, uh, you know, inventing a new material to uh, characterizing it to um, specifying it for a project and then eventually starting using it after it's all validated. So it's a very long process. So what I'm doing myself this fall is going over how you make the steel, and, but I'm going to bring in a lot of engineering as well. So this is kind of just the official curriculum, and I know that you don't want to hear for two hours and how we cast metal. So we'll come with an example that goes with that that implies engineering uh, as well. But it's at least this for the purpose of your summaries or the purpose of your interests, you know, is, is a guiding point. If you say, I don't care, you know, how you make them. My thing is, I want to become a researcher on a certain aspect, so I'm not going to take this model. That's, you know, that's perfectly fine. We understand that. So what I do as a complementary in the spring is I do talk at, about material and service. There's a little bit of a duplicate or you know, a complementary aspect of material selection, but I don't go into the financial consequences of material selection. That's what Professor Eager is going to do with you guys uh, this term, and he does it very, very well. Um, so every, every semester we teach this class. I, from year to year, each fall and each spring, I repeat myself a little bit. Between fall and spring, I really don't. You know, the, even the examples, typically, I select them differently. The things I bring to class, there may be a few that are the same. Um, I've le been lecturing in fracture and fatigue. It's, it was my area uh, a long time ago, um, but now it's every other year. And it's, it's very more specific. If you're interested in uh, mechanical properties specifically of, of structural material, it really is one of my main areas. So what exactly have I done um, the past 10 years? Is a lot of material selection, testing material, analyzing material, a lot of um, failure analysis. So uh, I was on the team um, paid by NIST to, uh, to study the collapse of the World Trade Center. Uh, we did a full um, fine element simulation. We had to input the right material property for the softening of the steel in the cooling. And it's really a topic I cover in the spring. There's a lot um, about failure analysis that uh, is a great, it's a great experience to learn, unfortunately. It's, 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 a, it's a terrible event to have an incident, but it's, it's amazing how they have changed the building code as a consequence of 9-11. It made it a lot safer for, for, for this, this type of situation. Um, so without going into the detail, I also work as a consulting expert on the Macondos, the Deepwater Horizon. Um, well, blowout, and um, 
it was associated with uh, s some of the people who made equipment, made valves that were supposed to work. Uh, <laughs> There's a lot of uh, surrounding information about um, some of the effects that happen, and you may not be familiar with all of them, but um, they had some signs that you know something was going to happen. They had somebody very important coming up to do an inauguration, um, and that's and that's actually you know tell you the truth as far as safety, that's the best example. You are under pressure to try to do something, and you just can't follow the best procedure. You know, it is it is typically part of the reason. Uh, we, uh, as part of some of my groups, we had a not a, a tremendous. We we had a safety incident recently, and the the lesson learned is we are all knowledgeable. We know that we can't drive our car. <laughs> And not be paying attention, but you know, it, 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 these things just happen specifically if you're too tired, you're in a hurry, and you don't think about it enough. You know, and and some of those events, not the World Trade Center, but um, the uh, specifically the Deepwater Horizon, there's definitely an aspect of that in there on the operational aspect. And then, as far as uh, structural material and engineering. Uh, one thing that happened is they were going to close with always a drill pipe in the wells. It's part of the standard procedure, but the design essentially assumed that that pipe was going to be close to the center of the hole, and there is evidence that it was all the way against a wall because it buckled. So it's all about where do you stop your engineering? Are you going to engineer for this buckling worst case scenario or not? And the answer a lot of times is not straightforward. You really have to go through the elements, see um, you know, the kind of the, 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 the consequences and the cost and all that. I mean, money just does end up coming into play. If, it, if it's not, if you, if you got, if to make a valve, you're not, it's so expensive, you're not gonna be able to sell it, you're not gonna be useful. <laughs> Somebody's gonna just use somebody else's valve, you know? So it's, it, there's just a lot of, of, of practical consequences from actually working on those cases. And it's something that I've been told recently that I do have, I don't like to brag, but I do have to talk about some of these things. So no, you guys know right away from the first class where I'm coming from. Um, I have a very narrow view on a structural material. Um, I think of structural material as we subject them to a certain number of condition that I call the demand, and then they have a certain capacity. That's all, that's all I, I, I simplify it in my head, and whether it's a, it's a chemical situation, or whether it's a corrosion, or mechanical, or exactly what it is, it doesn't matter. You essentially have a capacity of the material and what you subject it to, and in the end, there has to be a ratio between them, so, so it's useful and safe. Is, is what we, we're striving for. So um, let's get going with a little bit more. I mean, I hope it wasn't too much philosophy. I always hesitate exactly how much I share, specifically about having one-year-old twin. Uh, they started really walking yesterday. It was exciting. Yeah, just go, go around and around and around, and you just start thinking more and more about safety, right? So, you know, <laughs> they're going up the stairs, it just, it never ends. Uh, it's going to become more and more complicated. Uh, all right, so safety. I'm sorry? <laughs> Do you think so? I, t I'll, yeah, I hope so. Yeah. It has been getting better ever since they've been three months old. I just... I don't know. Okay, so I want to talk about steel pipelines. It's something, it's essentially our first, what they call it, beachhead market for the uh, startup company I have. Um, we have 300,000 miles of transmission pipeline for oil and gas in the US. So what you see in red is the liquid lines going from state to states. And then in blue, you have the gas line, natural gas. We need that. If you try to have trucks and ships, well, ships can't deliver the center of the <laughs> But if you try any other way, <clears throat> it won't be as safe 
as pipelines. But who wants a pipeline in their backyard? You know, are you, I think you, you're raising your hand. You don't mind? <laughs> I, I don't, I'm just kidding. Nobody does. So there's a lot, there's, there's a, a lot of pressure. Uh, you may not follow that industry. I mean, this is something that I've learned recently, but the Keystone Project, and there's even in New England, we, we like natural gas. You know, it's cheaper, it's safe and into, into homes. Um, and it's, it, it doesn't have a whole lot of uh, consequences, you know. Uh, it's definitely safer than nuclear and it's better than coal. And, you know, it's just, but we have to get it from A to, a to Z. And the pipelines are the best way. Uh, again, it's very high pressure. And these are very old because it's getting progressively harder to put a new one in. So we have this demand, everybody, we're using more energy today than we did 20 years ago, but we don't have that many more pipelines than we did 20 years ago. Uh, so there's a, it's essentially for us a, a good opportunity to come and help not having this. Um, that's called bad press. Um, it, it doesn't happen very often in this. This is actually a student last semester. I mean, I knew about this, but this was a student last semester. She did our, our student project on this. She reviewed the NTSB report. Every time there's something that involves the loss of several life, NTSB comes in. Uh, National Transportation Safety Board um, to evaluate the situation and make recommendations. So. Uh, one thing that happened as part of that accident, that was back in the year 2010, is they did not know what pipe they had in the ground. And a lot of pipeline operators have that problem because it's a long time ago. And they bought the pipeline from somebody else, rent it, somebody else buys it, somebody repaired a section, and even in the first place, it's a construction site, so in the 50s and 60s, pipes come in and they put them in and they have a stack of paperwork, but they don't know where the pipe went. So if, when they know, when one of the big operators that's very, there are a lot of very prudent operators that really try to minimize the risk of this, the consequences to the environment and, and everything. When they go to their paperwork and they know they have one percent, let's say it's one percent of their pipe joints that are bad, they need to know which one it is. <laughs> you know, just, just having the, the, a certificate that they bought few from that mill that wasn't doing the best pipes, as found out 30 years later or 40 years later, it's not enough, so they have to identify them. So, we, what we provide um, as part of that solution is uh, strength determination in ditch. So we, we measure yield strength and we also characterize the welded seams. And I'll go, actually, I, if we have a little time in the end, I, I, I would like to explain, and I know Brian is a non-destructive testing expert, so he, I'd like to share with everybody a little bit how it works. But the idea there is to um, not have to remove a sample because those pipelines, they operate, say, 800 PSI, and it's, it's, let's say it's natural gas or any, whatever it is, there's a lot of pumping station through the line to get that flow going, to repressurize the line and energize it. So the idea to shut down that operation, remove the liquid for the, for the line or reduce the pressure, and start over again is extremely, extremely expensive. So <clears throat> they will do uh, hot taps or certain procedure where they essentially continue to flow. They build a bypass line, and then when it's all done, they cut open the opening so that the, the flow continues. It's, it's a very, very uh, expensive process. Uh, yesterday, we had our first field trial here in Everett uh, looking at a pipe that is very old, and they have to get it up again. It's, it, they're lucky because we're not using natural gas a lot, but in two months, we, it's not going to work. So right now, they use ships. They use the big tankers to provide the natural gas across that link of their network that is just missing. So there's just so many consequences of not being able to continuously operate that 
the idea to be able to know the yield without taking a sample out is, is very attractive to them. There's a way to take it out, and <clears throat> it's structural material we're talking about, so it's, it's good to go over this. Um, you can do what we call a hot top. So you put a clamp on the pipe, and you put an accessory. You have to weld it on and all that, and then you come with a drill, and you make a core hole into that, and then you close it when, it, when it's completely broken. And you got a lot of seals. It's a special equipment. It's essentially a $100,000 process to do this, mostly because you have to repair it. It's a little bit like if you have an old exhaust pipe on a car, and you try to weld it. And, and, and repair it, it's never as good as it was, and it needs to be as good as it was because those pipelines are used at full capacity. Um, so there's no real um, easy way to collect data without having consequences other than special non-destructive equipment, including the one that we're building. Now, there's a lot of other equipment to look for cracks and other anomalies, and that's not what we're doing. We're there really for the mechanical properties, including toughness. Um, so, um, this semester, I'm going to try to go over why we make this the way we do, which we'll just talk about now. This one, this one. So these three, these four, just very simple example, are made in very different ways, and there is a reason. It's money, right? You have to fulfill the function, and. Uh, you know, make it the least expensive possible. So I'll circulate those around and um, don't hurt yourself. This one's light, this one is fairly heavy. Uh, anybody very tired here? You, you can skip if you, if you feel you don't wanna do it, but I think it's fun. Um, well, you just, so this one is a casting, a sand casting. So it allows to make this very complex geometry and that's one of the first thing we're gonna go over exactly how you do these castings. And then it has a machine portion to be able to put the, uh, the bearings in. So it's very, very specific. Um, a hitch adapter. Um, this is all made of wrought material. So 20, 30 foot long bars of this shape, same for this, same for this. They cut it and then weld it together. And they make a lot of those. So why? Did they not cast this one? It's got also a pretty complex geometry. You know, it's just start this way, there's a hole here and all that. This has to be very resilient. This has to bend. Can't just break. And that would not be a good happening uh, when you're towing something. So uh, it's the same story with this one. This is a forging because it's to make a connection between um, you know, a gasoline or hazardous liquid tank and the pipe that comes out of it. Um, if you cast this, you won't get the, the ductility and strength to allow it to bend instead of breaking in the event that it had to. And the reason it's shredded is you're not as dependent on the welder on site to put that on correctly. So it's, it's mechanically interlock and the only thing that's gonna happen, it's gonna leak a little bit. And uh, you'll know about it, but it's not going to completely separate spray out. And, and burst. Uh, what about this one? What do you guys think happened here? Did it? Huh? Did it? Yeah, so it's cold pressed. It starts with a bar, and then you have a series of steps to, to mushroom the end of the bar to make that shape. It's, it's actually very, very strong, so it's not going to break here because you, you forge the material, you deform it, and you actually make it better than it was to begin with. But you do need to do it by steps, otherwise you'll break it. Um, uh, we'll cover those and a lot more uh, in the class. So I'll just leave them here. There's a lot of you guys, uh, if you're interested. Uh, so in the class, we'll start with the casting because that's the first thing that happens. All of these did start as a casting, and then they went through a deformation processing. And I'll explain why. I think it's, it's important for every engineer to know why you don't use these. Uh, in a lot of applications. So in aerospace, it's very rare to have a casting. It happens, and, there, and we'll go over those examples where it's okay. Uh, you know, anything that is cheap uh, will typically be cast because you don't have to do anything else. You just make the mold and you, you just keep printing stuff. So it's, it's very inexpensive to do it this way. 
All right, so technically, because I do want to teach you a little bit um, how we go about as metallurgists or material scientists to process materials. So when we start from their casting, one thing that we worry about is um, what's going to happen to my strength and ductility depending on how I process it. So you can see here, um, it has a little bit of a history about grains, how the grains evolve with the temperature that you're processing your material. And these are just all decisions you have to make. If you buy something that's cold form, it's not the same as something that was hot roll. Uh, and it looks very, very simple, but I, I, a lot of you will eventually see a drawing. It's like, oh, I, I want some cold form steel. Okay, okay, why? <laughs> you know, what does that mean? So we'll cover that. I'm not trying to do it, all of this today, but I want to emphasize that we're going to be trying to talk about a little bit about the science. So I will teach you a little bit the processes and the reasons why at different temperature, like here, it's, it's kind of interesting that you start with big grains, they become small, and then they grow again. We call that recrystallization. And there's so many consequences, even for medical devices. If you have something made out of aluminum, when you prepare the, the aluminum, if you don't have a good recrystallization, it makes a defective product. Uh, and um, it, it is probably an example I just need to spend maybe 15 minutes with you guys uh, so you can fully understand it. Um, so let's assume we cast the material. That's going to be, you know, maybe uh, two lectures to go over all of that. And we're going to talk about how you make it better by uh, forming. Yes? Can you have a grainless material? A grainless material, yes. It happens rarely. Um, one reason we do it uh, is for certain um, uh, aircraft engine components uh, that are exposed to high temperatures, so the blades on the, um, on the, on the uh, aircraft engine um, end up being exposed to, so it's so high of a temperature. Yes, it's extremely expensive, yeah. Uh, the regular process of casting and deforming will lead to a lot of crystals forming at the same time. So when you go, it's, it's just like water. You know, you, if you look at a window and, and it starts to freeze, you'll see a lot of spots. These are nucleation sites for forming crystals of ice. Uh, that's exactly what happens with the metal or the polymer when you cool it down. So if the polymer crystallizes, it's going to start to crystallize at a number of areas, and then eventually it all it becomes solid. And it's, it's, it is kind of a, 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 a favored process. If you are able to make a single crystal, uh, and you heat it up and there's no load, it remains, so it's stable. It's not like it's not stable to be a single crystal. It's just the kinetic to get there that is very, very difficult. Um, and I'll cover that. I'll bring the example and how you do it uh, as well. Thank you. Uh, heat treatment. You may have heard that um, in forging, you'll take the steel red and you throw it in the water. That's quenching. We'll go over what happens <laughs> in a way that hopefully you'll remember. Because don't do that. Don't just take the steel, <laughs> put it in the water, and think that you made it better. You made it worse. Uh, it becomes very, very high strain, but also brittle. So if you've taken, uh, I don't know what you guys read when you were young, uh, you know, but my generation, my grandfather told me this, that you know, cooling stuff in the water was making it stronger. He forgot, or maybe he's, he's gone now, I can't ask him. But uh, I, he forgot to tell me that you also want to heat it up after. And that's called tempering. So making it more of a compromise so it's not going to shatter like glass is, is, is what follows this quenching process. And we'll go over why. And we'll go over what happens if you try to do it with aluminum, you do the opposite. So if you take hot aluminum, cool it really fast like an aircraft engine aluminum, it's very soft. 
And, in, and when you heat it up again, it's aging and it's becoming stronger, just like people, right? <laughs> uh, so hopefully uh, you find that interesting and there's, there's a lot of details and uh, I know nobody's taking this class thinking that they're gonna be called a metallurgist, I am. Uh, so sorry about that, <laughs> but uh, I do would like you to get something out of it and at least as engineers, it is as important to know stuff that it is to know what you don't know. Like if you, if you get out of this class having a better knowledge of things that you know and things that you may need some help for, well, I feel like I've done my job because I think it's, 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 it's extremely important. That's how we do make safe decisions and that's how you progress quickly as an engineer. You don't make mistakes because you know the things that you shouldn't be doing, you know, that you should be seeking help for. All right. Um, joint, well, I didn't even talk about this one. It's, it's okay. So uh, we're gonna talk about why you prepare the surfaces lots of times to make them more useful. It's a, it's, 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 it's a quick thing, but it, you know, it's used quite a bit actually. Uh, so, but it's after you've learned and understood all the other aspects, the heat treatment and what happens, it's, you're just gonna find it very easy. And, and I'll just pick a few examples that, uh, that you'll remember. Joining is an important aspect. It's used so much. And the reason is you can't make a car as a single piece or, uh, especially not as a single crystal, just to, to follow up on the discussion we had. So you have to put pieces together. You can put bolts. If you've tried it, it's painful because you have to drill the holes and have everything line up and bolt them tight so nothing gets loose after a while. If you weld it, you essentially link the crystals on one side with the crystals on the other. It's great. It doesn't move. It may break, all right, but it doesn't move. So making joints by welding is an extremely big industry. Uh, and Brian actually knows probably more about exactly how big it is than I do, and, and Professor Eager. I've been a welding inspector. Uh, these days I do more general structural materials, but it's a very, very big industry because it's an efficient way to make buildings. Uh, you have columns and you have horizontals. You can try to come. <laughs> with a lot of big bolts, but now you gotta have this big mag drill and try to line everything up. It's very, very difficult. The other way is you take the two pieces, you get them together, and then you weld, you fusion weld. Um, we'll go over how it works and what are the consequences. And I'll tell you right off the bat, one of the problem with joining is it doesn't give you as good of a, a strength than a regular bar. So I take a bar, that was cast and then deform and forge essentially. And I have another that's the same. Let's say I put them together as a T connection. Then I weld that T. So I have a casting at that intersection and it's a point where there's a lot of load. So that, that's, that's an unfortunate <laughs> consequence of, of joining that it doesn't give you as good of a strength typically as the original material. Uh, or toughness, it, there are some changes essentially in properties and they tend to be at areas where you have a lot of load. Now you can try to engineer around it. That's what I've done when I built my own trailer. I couldn't trust myself to make the perfect weld. So I made the beam cross as opposed to just really welding them on, you know, and that's what's done in aircrafts. You don't have a weld at a critical location and you use rivets. Um, so we'll go over a lot of that and um, I really hope you enjoy the class and I always welcome feedback. Um, we do have a little time, so there are a couple things I want to do. Um, talk just a little bit about what I'm developing and one other thing I'll do this semester is I'll probably stop the tape just a couple minutes earlier in case you have other questions. Um, and it's very hard the Q&A anyway for me to repeat everything, so I'll do that. And uh, I hope that's, that helps it more, make it a little bit more attractive. So I showed this where we, we have what we call 
Some people in the industry calls that our fish tank right now because it's, it's just a prototype unit, you know, but it works and it's accurate. So what it does is instead of doing an indentation hardness test on the material, we slide on the surface just like a boat on the river and it leaves a groove behind. We have three of these styluses running over the surface. So this is one test here with three styluses going together and then we go back and forth and collect the profile information behind it. So it's very superficial. It goes only to 1% of the depth. And um, it provides the stress-strain curve, what's going on across the, um, the a heat affected zone. If you have a weld, so here what happens is you go over a weld, and it gives you some information about the type of welding process that was used in the case of pipelines. So um, we have reached a certain level of recognition. We validated by testing ourselves. We passed in blind testing. Uh, and uh, we really are in a hurry to start making revenues before we run out of money. <laughs> and I have to go and get more money. Uh, it'll come across, you know, uh, and through the class uh, just because it's um, something that I'm very involved with. And it, it includes how they make the steel pipes back then. There's some pipes were made called seamless. So if you go all around, it's the same piece of steel. So a lot of them were made from flat plate that are bent into a circle, and then you have a longitudinal well going across. Because it's cheaper. You, you, you roll, and you make your good quality product, and you roll it over, put the well, and then, but then it's like a hot dog sausage. So if you heat it up, and pressurize it, you know where it's going to split. Uh, and that's, that's probably the biggest problem in the industry, those seam welds, because they are oriented in the hoop stress direction. There's twice the stress in the pipe around the circumference that there is longitudinal. So they take a lot of pipes and they field weld the joints together, but those have half the load, so they don't tend to be a problem. What tends to be the problem is what was made at the factory to actually make the pipe. Yes? It's a very good question. So the question about uh, how long it takes for a pipe to fail. Yes. So if there is uh, a empirical knowledge that if a pipe fails within the first 30, 35 years of its life, it's typically because of corrosion. So you just lost too much thickness. And based on your yield strength of that pipe, you have a burst. When you, when you get to be longer than that, it's typically because the protection for corrosion was really well put on. <laughs> and it's, it's not going to corrode because people maintain these assets very well for, for corrosion. But then it becomes an issue of cracking. So you, you always have pressure fluctuations on the material. And eventually, it leads to fatigue. And you start some small flaws or anomalies, and those will grow. And yes, you can, you can quantify how fast they grow, but you need to know the resistance of the material to initiate those cracks and to grow them, and specifically in the weld area. Uh, it's information that is very, very critical in uh, you know, probabilistic analysis of failure. Uh, but they need more material data. In other words, they know what the load is on the material. When we talk about the med, they know what the thickness is of the wall. They know also what the pressure they're putting in. But they do not have enough of that knowledge of the material strength under these conditions. And that's why they're struggling for finding a solution. And they've been helping us validate our tool, essentially. Yes? Has the material strength like, evolved since like, the pipes were made? Like, very, very good question. The question was about did the way of making those pipes evolve so they're better today? They are by far better. Everything that was made 1970 and before that were welding processes that are very well known today to have, you know, drawbacks or pitfalls as opposed to anything that's been done these days. And, and a lot of it is just optimization. Uh, high frequency welding that was developed in the 70s and 80s and just started to become the standard. 
uh, is just much better for avoiding a low cracking resistance uh, or, and a low strain of those welded seams. The steel itself also is, is become more homogeneous in that same time frame, this, the 70s or 80s. So anything that's in the ground and is less than 20, 30 years, uh, people feel a lot better about in term, even if it's even in 15, 20 years from now. But the material verification, what I talked about San Bruno, is only since San Bruno that they really sp spent the effort of developing this database that when they build something or they repair something, all the information goes there and it's, it's permanently maintained. And it, it's, but it's again, it's, it's a lesson learned. You, you can't assume that 50 years ago, uh, they should have taught and known what we know today. You know, it, it, but, but again, that, that speaks to what we discussed earlier on, that if you're gonna go and decide on making a new pipe, well, you probably should know <laughs> all these lesson learns from all these years and these four or five generations on how to make pipes before you start making the next one. <laughs> it's a very, very good point. Thank you guys for that question. I, I'll have to stop the tape. I don't want to take too much time.